Good evening. Thanks again for coming out um, to uh, the next installment in the GSD's uh, fall uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm Charles Waldheim, Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture, and it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce to you uh, this evening's speaker, uh, Richard Weller. Um, once a year, the Department of Landscape Architecture and the GSD sponsor um, an Olmsted lecture um, named in honor of Frederick Law. And the Olmsted lecture historically has been organized around uh, the history and theory of ideas in the field of landscape. And so it's in that space I was very pleased um, that Richard accepted our invitation uh, to speak as the 2011 Olmsted uh, lecturer. Weller is a Winthrop Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Western Australia in uh, Perth, where he's director of the Australian Urban Design Research Center. Um, Richard is an extraordinarily accomplished uh, educator and researcher and a designer in his own right. Um, uh, his um, practice has included a range of really extraordinary internationally uh, recognized uh, design projects. I first came to know Richard's work um, in the wake of a conference that was held um, in Melbourne in 2000-2001. Uh, uh, the so-called MESH uh, conference or conferences were a series of lectures that um, apparently students of landscape architecture in Australia uh, agitated for and eventually demanded in a way, at least that the leadership of the student group wanted to um, embarrass their professional leadership into doing the right thing in terms of diversifying and broadening the range of topics attendant to landscape architecture. Um, that so-called MESH conference and the MESH book that came from it and came from, from RMIT in Melbourne was the first introduction that I had to, to Richard's work. Um, and at this moment, 2000-2001, uh, um, when the discourse around landscape urbanism was beginning to break out uh, in English internationally in, in the UK and in North America and Australia and uh, part, parts of the world, um, Weller offered the most um, salient and um, critical take on both landscape urbanism and some of the major uh, proponents of that, both designers and theorists alike. Um, and it was based on that uh, contribution to the MESH conference uh, that I invited him to contribute a chapter to the Landscape Urbanism Reader. Um, in that chapter, um, titled An Art of Instrumentality, uh, Weller argued that postmodern landscape architecture has done a, a boom trade in cleaning up after modern infrastructure as societies in the first world at least, shift from primary industry to post-industrial information societies. In common landscape practice, and here I am referring to the perception of landscape architecture by what is published and awarded in Europe, America, and Australia, landscape architects seem mostly employed to deal with spaces where infrastructure is not. They are employed to say where infrastructure should not be and are generally expected to create the illusion that mechanical infrastructure is not where it is. And with that, with that paragraph, which, which blew the back off of my head when I read it, he summar summarized on the one hand the aspiration of landscape architecture to deal with the wake of industry, uh, brownfields and the like, but simultaneously addressed the kind of persistence of, of image making and our often complicit role in uh, camouflaging the operational economy and industry of, of, of the cultures that we serve. Um, since that time, uh, Weller's work has focused increasingly on um, uh, what our colleague uh, Carl Steinitz has referred to as the, as the large scale, uh, focusing on landscape as an instrument of planning. Um, and in that context, um, he's published uh, recently in 2009, uh, Boomtown 2050 uh, on Perth itself as, a, as a, both an analytique, but also a series of design-based uh, scenarios uh, for a city that's uh, so far on the, on, the, on the western edge of Australia that when I landed in Melbourne a few years ago and I, I called him up, Richard said, you know, it's, it's really lovely of you to offer to come out to Perth, but, but don't bother. It's like a six-hour flight from Melbourne, and it's more likely that we would see each other on the east coast of the States. And so I'm very pleased to finally meet him on the east coast uh, of the U.S. Please join me in welcoming Richard Weller. Thank you, Charles. It's really nice to be here, everyone. Um, now, can I just get the lights down a little bit, please? I, you know, choosing the title for a lecture is always a, it's um, a slightly fraught process because it's like the beginning of a project. You know, the initial conditions are so important. And I thought zooming, the idea of shifting scale would be a good thing to work with. I, I don't, however, want the idea of shifting scale to, I don't want to work it too hard. 
The lecture is not just going to be about scale shift, but I do want it as a sort of an undercurrent in the room with us. And, you know, you're all really smart people. You can connect the images I'm showing you and some of the things I'm going to say um, with, with the issue of scale, which I think is important. A couple of um, um, statements about that. Um, I guess what I mean by scale shift is that I think... It, I think I've, I've, as I've matured, I think I've arrived at the point where I really do believe now that landscape architecture's capacity to link the part, which is generally a small scale item, with the large scale. So take a garden, for example, and link it to the globe or the universe in both a scientific sense and a poetic sense. I think that's our business. I think that's unique to us. Dentists don't do that, you know? That's just not what they do. Scientists do it. Um, Scientists, however, are so preoccupied with the part and becoming, um, you know, the, their research agendas and, and the way funding is organised internationally. They are so... It's actually very fragmented, very hard for a scientist to be holistic. For us, it's easy. And, and, and I, a bit of a proviso there, we speak easily of science and art. You'll typically hear landscape architects say, oh, you know, ask them what they do, and they will say, well, we, we, we kind of commingle the sciences and the arts. I think we have to be careful about that because I don't know many landscape architects that do good science or understand science, and I do speak to scientists. I have serious conversations with scientists, and we get stuck... Even into the first sentence of our conversations, we get stuck on, on semantics. We, the designers speak a very different language to the sciences, and it takes me a long time just to sort out the common ground, you know, semantically, so we can proceed to have a productive relationship. On the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, with regard to the arts, I don't know many landscape architects that are serious artists. And by that I mean, I don't... I, I, I still don't see a lot of work in landscape architecture that is truly driven by ideas and self-reflexive with regard to representation. And, and by ideas, I, mean, I don't mean things like, oh, my design, the strategy I'm using is a kind of a morphed grid. Let's say it's a sort of formal gesture or a formal instrument from which you can proceed to develop up some form. I, I don't think that's so much an idea. And that's just one of the tools in your toolbox. So I've always been interested in a landscape of ideas. And that's very been, typically been very, very language-based um, as opposed to um, well, intuitive, let's say and mysterious. Um, I've, I've been very interested in language and how it can be encoded into a project and, and, and that certainly satisfied me for quite a while and John Dixon Hunt published a lot of that work to his credit because it was risky work, he certainly didn't have to do it. Um, I have moved on and it might worry some of you that do know my work because I've sort of gone from what I would have, I would, you know, it's a little bit pretentious but I, di I did push it as hard as I could for my work to be an art practice. I wanted to test landscape architecture and push it so far that it broke. And then from there I've come back and I've really gone to the other end of the spectrum now and, and I'm intoxicated with, with designing the whole world in a sort of planning sense. And, and, and hopefully the pendulum will come back from there and we'll, we'll, we'll arrive at a, um, at, a, at a nice middle ground perhaps between art and instrumentality that Charles referred to. So Zoomscape times five is the title. I really wanted to do a lecture for you that went from the details of design right out to the, almost the cosmological. I tried it, it didn't work, it was too much information. I would have kept you here for hours. I don't want to do that. Um, I want this to be short and sweet. So without further ado, I'll try and push through it. Um, I, I, I want to start with the cliche. Okay, I, I would like to know how many landscape architectural lectures have started with this image. Uh, this was photographed in 1972, of course, and profoundly changed things, but it's a degraded image now. It's really a cliché. But that's okay. I can breathe a little bit of life into it. Um, the planet, if, in case you don't know, is four billion years old. It has, in its time, produced 30 billion species. Insofar as we know, that is the most creative entity in the universe, in the known universe. And, it, it, you know, it's extraordinary that we treat it with such disdain. Um, but those times are a-changing. Um, it currently supports 7 billion human beings. And I'm going to come back to this later because it's a big point. But the, the, the demographers are now predicting that population growth will reach 10 billion by mid-century and then it will stabilise. I'll come back to that because that's the big number we have to worry about. 7 billion human beings extracting a $70 trillion economy. 
out of those natural systems. Now, of course, what's happened is that we've started to slow cook the place. Now, I'm just, I'm just making the image a little bit more honest now and less sublime and factoring in the, 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 the carbon that we've put into the atmosphere since industrialisation. Prior to that, it was largely irrelevant. Um, you know, carbon, we're told, should be stabilised at 350 parts per million. We're up around 390 now. And if you, if you think about global social justice issues and you're interested in lifting billions of people out of poverty in the next century, it's very hard to see how that carbon footprint won't increase radically. So we're not talking about stopping the carbon issue. We're talking about human beings adapting to a radical period of climate change. There's nothing actually unusual about that in terms of natural history. Um, however, if you look at, if you think about ecosystems and you think of a, of a, of a species that reaches the proportions that we've reached, um, seven billion, you'd say that's a runaway species. You know, now typically in natural systems, the ecosystem will check itself. Ecosystems never reach a, a stability or harm, a harmony. Forget that. They are, they are chaotic and, and always far from equilibrium. That's the beauty of how things work, how, the, how what, that, that drives the creativity of the universe, the, the asymmetry and the disproportion, not harmonics and, and stasis. But, but typically what has happened in natural history, when species have run away, when they've gained the upper hand, they have almost invariably created the conditions of their own demise. Cyanobacteria, for example, for a couple of billion years swarmed over the surface of the planet and what did they do? They emitted oxygen, which was toxic to themselves. Now, we're not, in a dispassionate sense, we're not doing something too dissimilar. The difference between us and cyanobacteria, of course, is we have consciousness. I mean, insofar as we know, uh, consciousness is, is not entirely unique to human beings, but it's, it's, it's relatively um, uh, operative you know, in our species. And I think the environmental movement is, is little more than the feedback through a, a global system of consciousness, which is really trying to um, realign a species so that it can arrive at some form of sophisticated reconciliation with the natural systems upon which it depends. Right? Now... You know, the other, the other problem, this is getting back, this is now socio-political, is the fact that we have seven billion people. A billion of those people are malnourished. That means they don't have enough food and they, they don't have access to potable water. That is criminal. Modernity, the project of modernity after all these years still can't deliver basics, the basics of settled society to a billion human beings. Now... Um, that figure is expected to increase. Now, at, simultaneously, us in the first capitalist world have been projecting images of the desired for a long time now and, and, and in a sense, encouraging a global market and pulling, pulling societies into our, our economic logic. So it, 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 it seems to me to be implausible to suddenly say to the Chinese, the Indians and, and so on, that they cannot have all of the things we take for granted. So as all of these, as population reaches these higher levels, as people try to lift themselves out of poverty, which they have an absolute right to do, unless you're prepared to tell them they don't, um, we are in for very interesting times. Now, we are, if, if 7 billion people live the way Australians or Americans do, the way we take more or less for granted, we need five planets. And there it is, I've designed it. It's ready to go. That is, that is a monstrosity. Um, so what do we do? Well, we have to try and increase the yield that we get out of the one planet we do have. So the, the pressure on agriculture is going to be extreme because you've got to, you, we've, 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 got to, we've got to draw out more food um, without cutting down more forest. Cutting down forest now is like chopping out the last bits of your lungs. It's a stupid thing to do. So the agricultural landscape, I might come back to that in a moment, is going to be increasingly technological um, and advanced. And, and it's something that landscape architects in the 21st century might, might start to align themselves with. I think we've ne neglected the agricultural landscape. I mean, there are other worst-case scenarios. I mean, I'm not saying technology will save us, but I think the technological landscape, based on research, is going to be crucial to this larger issue that I'm just trying to sort of sketch out for you as a way of setting the scene for the rest of the lecture. 
So we can't do that. Um, that that's an absurdity. Um, um, and, and, and I don't think we can, we can condemn vast numbers of people to poverty uh, just so that we can continue to live the way we do. So things are going to have to change, and there's other reasons why things are going to have to change, but I'll come to those in a moment because I'll talk briefly about resources. But this is perhaps another iteration of an image of, of our home, of the planet. This, of course, is a global city. Now, the world doesn't look like that. You don't see Manhattan everywhere. But in a sense, it's a true image because the infrastructure of the city, of the global city, of urbanisation, has gone to every corner of the globe and sucked out the nutrients and will continue to do so. So it's a highly, the whole planet is a highly, highly managed garden, if you like, although gardens are far too romantic kind of image of, of, of what it really is. Certainly the infrastructure of the city has gone to the ends of the earth. Now, the, the figure I mentioned to you earlier, 10 billion human beings, they are expected to be with us. That, that will be the total population by 2050. That's, it doesn't matter if it's before or after. But demographers are now more or less in agreement on that figure. The, the interesting thing about that figure is that thereafter, global population is expected to reach stasis or begin to decline. Now, I think that's fascinating. Just think four decades ahead. Many of you, that's, you're still in your careers, you know, and our, the work we're doing now is, I think that's the big number. You can be, you know, awash with data and statistics and it, it, it's mind-boggling and you don't know quite how to deal with it. But I think that's the big, that's the one statistic that we, we might have to orient ourselves toward. Why will population stabilise at 10 billion? Because of urbanisation. Because of cities. The remarkable thing is that cities have generally incubated people since we started building them. We've been building them for 10,000 years. In fact, it was a stupid idea to build cities. Stopping in one place is, it was, it was a really, I mean, apart from all the fruits of philosophy and the arts and technology and so on, the city is fundamentally flawed because it always has to extract more resources out of its, its surrounding landscape. It, it, it's funda uh, settlement is fundamentally unsustainable. Now, whether that's the case or not into the 21st century with all of our creative intelligence applied to urbanisation, I, I, I am profoundly optimistic. I actually foresee, and I don't say this lightly, I foresee a species of 10 billion people living relatively well on one planet through the agency of urbanisation and its related systems. So if we, excuse me for being grandiose, you know, I'm not trying to just be impressive and talk about big things, but in terms of landscape architecture, I think we have a right to kind of deal with that scope or worry about it or, or be aware of it. And I, I say creative intelligence through the agency of urbanisation because I, I think everything related to, to cities, which is the sum total of, you know, what we are, needs to be redesigned. At the moment, our cities are linear and mechanistic. They're radically unsustainable. They are, they have to be, that thing has to be converted into a sophisticated metabolic entity and start to approximate the way in which nature works. And I don't mean nature as in birds and bees. I mean nature as a radically creative and destructive force. And I think that's what we'll see. Increasingly, landscape architecture is a fundamental part of it. What's happening here is going to play into landscape architecture. Um, um, now, innovation will be... You know, look, even if we're, if, if you don't believe necessarily in human beings being creative and intelligent and able to sort through some of the challenges of the 21st century, they're certainly rat cunning. I mean, we're going to work our way through this. Innovation is going to be pushed. It's going to be forced upon it by some of these numbers. There are many more, but I just picked a few. Here's a, these are the timelines of the fundamental resources upon which the global city depends. Oil. Now, these numbers represent the current stocks. In other words, what we know. We haven't necessarily mined it yet, but we know it's there. So there may be new discoveries, but I tell you what, we've pretty much, we've pretty much studied every, every square metre or every square foot, as you would say, of the planet. We more or less know what's available. So we're talking about oil expiring in four decades. We're talking about natural gas running out in 60. Iron, predominantly dug out of Australia and sent up to China. That'll run out in, in uh, 72. Coal. 133, that's interesting. Uranium is also interesting, 97. You know, there's a, there is a kind of a, an emerging discourse about a shift f to, back to uranium. You know, it's, it's almost, 
it's, we're able to talk about it again uh, because it would, would, would help us minimise our carbon footprint. But even if we did, I mean, there's a whole... We still don't know what to do with the waste and reactors are very expensive and so on and so forth, but there's only 97 years' worth of, of supply. So all of those numbers... But the nasty one is the fact that coal will be with us for so long. Coal is the, the cheapest and, 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 and the best performer in terms of, you know, raw energy. Um, so our cities... I guess you could summarise that and say we've got, we've got about a century with which to radically redesign um, the, the, the organs of urbanisation, the, the entire infrastructure. So that's a very interesting century that we're moving into and we're right at the beginning of it. Um, water, water is not running out because water, you know, there, there is a certain amount of water. The, the problem, what happens with water is it becomes increasingly inaccessible. inaccessible. Um, the, 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 this, this simple statement at the bottom summarises the challenge. We will have to, because of population increase and changing diets and, and, and so on, we have to extract twice the food with less arable land because we're losing a lot of arable land, losing a lot of topsoil globally, and do it with less water. So the pressure on landscape, there is going to be pressure on every square foot of landscape to do some work. You know, at the moment, you look around your cities, there's tonnes of space just doing nothing. Or, or we hand it over to aesthetics and, you know, it serves other sort of symbolic purposes. But landscape as a working terrain is going to be uh, increasingly important, I would say. Landscape planning is a dirty word. I haven't used that for a long time. It was something we used to laugh at because when I went to school, I was told very quickly I was going to be a steward of the earth and, and it was related to someone called McCarg and... And, and I was given punch cards to put into a computer that wasn't a computer like you know it. It was a, it was a behemoth that was in a different part of the university. So needless to say, I never went there. I wanted to draw and paint. And, 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 and I, I became inspired by a visit to the philosophy department. That's where people spoke about ideas and I could relate that back to landscape. But landscape planning, perhaps in this century, is going to become something... Or the scale of planning, perhaps we need to... We, we, we need to shuffle across scales. We don't want to get stuck, stuck with gardens. We don't want to get stuck with urban parks. We don't want to get stuck with urbanism. We, don't, we, we need to shuffle across all those scales and get out to the large scale. I mean, here you've got the Indus River and the Nile, for example, these catchments out of which civilization originally grew. And almost tragically and poetically, the, rivers, the, the mythic rivers of paradise are running dry. These, you know, the people that are paying attention to these rivers at the moment are not landscape architects, it's the Pentagon. <laughs> because these are the sorts of basins where geopolitical conflict is going... These are flashpoints. These are your future flashpoints where resource wars will be played out because of a lack of water and food. Fundamentals. Now, you know, is it... Is it am I allowed to even ask the question, should, should landscape architects be involved in that sort of thing at that sort of scale? And, and if the answer is no, well, then who should? Well, I would have thought we have the intellectual equipment and the traditions to deal with landscape systems. And, and in fact, the systems are now... We're talking about basics. We're talking about food and water and populations. I would have thought we, have, we can speak to that kind of problem. And, look, to make it a bit more personal for you guys, I think schools like this... I mean, you know, you, you and Penn and some of the other best schools in the world, um, I would have thought should be producing people who are capable of thinking in these sorts of terms. You, you know, you're not, you're not coming here to, to, to leave and fill up the rank and file of officers. I, there's thousands of universities that can do that. We need leaders. We need serious leaders. Visionaries, if you'll excuse the cliché. I think these are... Forget the salons of Paris and Berlin and, 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 and so on. I think, I think you need to be um, looking at these places. You know, if I was a graduate now, I'd be making a beeline for Shanghai for a start. Um, uh, some of the other ones, which are clearly tougher, would be you know, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Nigeria. These are lands, emerging landscapes, mega cities, and I just don't think we, we don't even know how to deal with these places in terms of governance, culture, ecology. The opportunity is there, and these are the, these are, these are the hot spots, if you like, where, where work needs to be done. Let me bring it back now to, to something we do understand, which is sprawlscape, right? You know, just your average anywhere in America, anywhere in Australia, 
um, the sort of monstrosity that we've created for ourselves, for which we have to take responsibility. I'm fascinated by these landscapes. Most landscapes, they're not glamorous. I spent years avoiding them. I've since tried to reorient my practice towards some of these banal places and try to understand the logistics of them. And I think I've got people like Charles and the movement of landscape urbanism to thank for that. It's helped me move in that direction. Um, and I, for, for that reason and various others that I hope I have time to mention, I, I, I strongly endorse the movement. And I, but of course, we need to now we need to develop that discourse critically. But just, I'll, I'll just point, I've, I've got, I think, ten commandments, or ten topics, not commandments, they're topics that are, that, are, uh, that are part of this banal terrain that you see there. Sequester carbon. You have to make that landscape do a bit of work vis-a-vis -vis carbon. You have to make it, we're going to have to mitigate heat islands. I know, no, I know Nobel Prize winning scientists working on heat island effect. Oh, I'm a landscape architect. I thought, heat island, let's plant a few trees, it'll be all right. You know, and tr I'm having conversations with scientists about heat island mitigation. It's an incredibly sophisticated area. I'm, you know, I think we need to try and turn the science through creative processes. We have to apply it, we've got to get it on the ground. Um, think about enhancing biodiversity. And I don't mean prelapse area and nature, I mean novel ecosystems, mongrel systems, hybrid systems, you know, um, injured systems. But how do we inject more life into landscapes which we've thoroughly drained of life? I mean, I, I'm, I look forward to, to all sorts of new ecologies emerging out of toxicity. But just bring it on, we need more life. Um, harvest, clean and recycle water. Water is the new gold, I think, in the States. I, I've, I've spoken to a few people. It's a big issue here. It's a huge issue in Australia, the most arid country on the planet. We're really, we are, we're only surviving because of desalination plants, and I'll show you that later. Um, we need to improve soil and integrate food production. There's a lot of Photoshop kicking around at the moment about food. I mean, it's, it's starting to become a bit of a bore. Um, a few years ago, people thought I was mad talking about cities producing food. I'll show you a food producing diagram for, for urbanisation at the end of the lecture that I think might be legitimate. Um, but certainly producing some forms of food within these systems is, is, is going to be important. Developing closed loop industrial ecologies instead of linear wasteful ecologies. That's, that's an interesting emerging area. We have to neutralise and reuse waste. You know these things. I mean, this is now the new sort of stock in trade working um, brief for a landscape architect in this century. Interconnect new transport systems, retrofit residential areas. I'm interested in that, low, especially low den density suburbia. You can get in there and retrofit. I, I, don't, I, I don't buy this argument that the suburbs are doomed. I think the intelligentsia and people like Kunstler, they like to look down their nose at the suburbs. I think there's potential to turn suburbs into productive landscapes. I'll, I'll come back to that point later on too. We have to create new residential areas, and I'll tell you why, because I've looked at the stats for the United States. You've got a lot of people coming in here. They've got to live somewhere. Um, provide public amenity, of course. We're good at that. We already do that. And then we've got to mix all those things up. They're not separate entities. We've got to try and integrate them and work with... And this is what Chris... I'm glad Chris is here tonight, and I wish I had a, his quote up, that landscape architects are systems builders. And it's, it's a better quote than that. I just can't remember the whole thing. But... Chris describes landscape architects as people that can, can work these systems and deal with governance and economics and real politic. You know, we're not these sort of artists or wearing the black beret doing the occasional sketch or, or, or coming into meetings saying, just believe me because I'm a creative genius. No, 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 you've got, we've got to win arguments. And that, that is, that, that, that's the rough and tumble of politics. Uh, which I've become recently very involved with. And I'm, I want to make that point to you tonight too. That's, that goes back to representation. You need to create a set of images and set a language, a way of talking in a compelling manner when you're sit talking to the governor. And you've got a couple of minutes. You've got to pitch it, explain it, and try and get some buy-in to start working some of this terrain. And it's not easy. Um, this is a sensational image of future agricultural landscapes. I'm just going to drift a little bit into aesthetics for a moment. I think, you know, this is a bit, a bit dramatic, but I think agricultural landscapes will look more like this rather than less. Franken foods being produced in Frankenscapes. Um, that said, there's probably going to also be a new kind of naturalism. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, um, it needn't, the modernist notion that I've usually subscribed to that that the thing should reveal its technological origins as a kind of representational honesty. That might not be the issue. I think in, in the, the emerging century, you'll find forms of naturalism. You just won't know whether it's been genetically manufactured. You won't know the technology that's involved. 
I mean, what we'll be looking for is forms of landscape that, irrespective of their aesthetic, the, the importance will be how they perform. Oh, that goes to this slide. This is a lovely... Um, this is an Australian artist called Patricia Piccinini, and she, she starts to push your buttons and confuse you as to what's beautiful and what's natural. On the one hand, you look at the girl and she, she's... You know, that's a normal image of beauty. We're familiar with that. Um, that's part of the economy of... of, the, 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 of, 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 of of um, you know beauty, and then you look at the rat on the uh, with the ear on it, and suddenly you can't you balk at that. You know we're not used to that, not yet anyway. We're not used to the monstrous. And I'm not saying we should make landscapes that have you know look like ears on rats, but I think there are clues in here for landscape architecture, because ultimately we have to make aesthetic commitments. You know we actually do arrive at an aesthetic proposition. Um, so this is, this is not so much about aesthetics. Well, it is, but it's about design process, just briefly. The, the notion that typically the typical uh, Western European tradition of, from classicism, you know, from beginning with Plato, really, that the world or the body or nature can be forced into or we can find in the natural world the proportions of classical beauty. I think that's probably not so useful to us now. You know, Leonardo's Vitruvian ideal man here is not so not a useful image of the natural world and how we should relate to it. The image of acupuncture is, I think, because with that, it's a very precise move. You put that pin in, you think of it as a stake in the ground in the earth. You have to get it right and you have to be more precise. But what happens after you've put that pin in and been quite precise, the engine room of the natural system or, or the body takes over and does the work. So it's a fairly, it's an elegant use of, see, whereas the image on the right is really, um, you know, we, we, the, the design does all the work and, and, and lays out the whole proposition. The image on the left, the notion of acupuncture is the precise move, which is catalytic and from which things unfold over time, time. Not just shift in scale um, in terms of space, but I also wanted to talk about shift in terms of time. Um, every site has a history and a future, and that's another hard way to think for us, to, but, it, but it's central to landscape architecture. Thinking in the fourth dimension is our property. Before, you know, architecture struggles with that. That's our domain. Um, I think thinking in time is an ecological way of thinking too. Just briefly, I can illustrate it. Take this object. An architectural view of that object is it's got a nice shape, its form kind of follows its function, it works in my hand, Yada, yada, yada. Take a four-dimensional view of that object, an ecological view of that object, a landscape architectural view of that object. I would unpack everything in it, take all of its constituent parts and run their histories back in time. Where did they come from? I would also run all of the parts forward in time. Where are they going? Just for a dumb a little object like that, I would have a very complicated map if I did that. Do it for a house. Think of your own house. Unpack everything in it. Find their origins, their paths. Find their histories of all the materials, how it all came together. You, and, and then where it's going into the, into the future, you'll have a very, very... Com it's madness. You have a very complicated diagram. But through computation, perhaps we can, we can work with that material. OK. That's the introduction. <laughs> no, no. No, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. We will... Uh, I've clipped... The, I've cropped this lecture. And so I'm not going to hold you. I'm not going to hold you for long. I want, this is the work I'm doing now. It's, it, I'm taking risks here, and some of these things are cartoons. This is incipient. It's not yet. It's not. It's not. It's not um, matured. It, 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 it's, I'm, I'm seeking funding, putting teams together. I'm looking at the issue of population growth in my country on a national scale. There's, there's, there's the land mass of Australia. It currently supports 22 million people. Here's the issue. The issue for us is that that population will double to 42 million according to our government statistics, uh, by mid-century. Now, you think, that's only California, you know, it's not a big deal in terms of the number, but in relation to the most arid landscape on the planet, it's an issue, and it's also an issue from infrastructure and urban design uh, problems insofar as the existing nature, the whole country is going to double in a very brief period of time. Um, so that, for example, in the United States, that would mean that you're going to go from, say, what are you now, 320 million people to 640 in the next four decades. That's a huge undertaking. Um, so, you know, and the other thing is, of course, no, there's no plan for this. There's no planning. There's no, the, the government's not across it. Um, so it seemed to me like a, a perfect place for landscape architects to start having a look. 
Um, you can go out with, with, with working into the future, you have to be careful. You go out to the end of the century, it becomes Star Trek. You get, the research gets wobbly. So I'm trying to keep it to mid-century because that's kind of... It's long enough for you to be projective and, and there's some imaginative scope there and you can run scenarios, but it, it's not so far that it just becomes, well, anything goes, you know. Um, just to do the numbers briefly for you, what 20 million people means in is 8.7 million freestanding suburban homes, OK? Because we calculated it now on 2.3 people per home. That's the average in terms of planning so suburbs. Probably very similar here. If you talk about apartments, you say, well, we're not going to build any suburbs. Those days are over. We're just going up. You've, you, you calculate it out at 1.9 people per apartment. You need 10.5 million apartments. Um, I'll make this clearer for you in terms of scale and what the issue that you're facing here in the United States. What's your current... Prop oh, it's 312. I said 320 earlier. I think that says 312. Um, 312 million. This, the forecast that I could get, and I only made a cursory sort of study of this, that you're predicted by 2050 to go to 392 million. Now, that's your middle figure. I reckon if you're planning something, you should work with the high figure. So I didn't, I didn't get what the high figure is, but... You probably like us, you work on a, a conservative figure, a middle figure and a high figure. That means in the United States you've got to build 34 million homes and you've got or, or 42 million apartments. So I ask you, are any of you involved in that or do you know any landscape architects that are involved in that? How are those decisions made as to where we should now sprawl for 34 million extra homes in the next four decades in the United States? And if we're not making those decisions, who is? I mean, going, just driving through the states, you can, it, things look incredibly uneven. If that's what the market does, then, you know, um, it can't be relied upon. So I'm trying to approach this rationally and develop a, a method by which I can make rational decisions with regard to my country. You see the scale of Australia there with regard to the United States. We're very big, but we, didn't, we weren't gifted with good soil all the way across Australia. I get my students to make images of the future, and they typically look like this. You know, you get a sort of binary good on the one hand and bad on the other and, and I can it's not so untrue that this is their response because this is the way the debate is played out it's particularly in Australia because population growth is now approached hysterically it's it's not it, the politicians play games with it and the public have knee-jerk reactions they blame everything for population growth the breakdown of infrastructure and it has a, it's got an ugly side to it you know that kind of politics that's involved but I'll illustrate the the the, two, the, the dualistic nature of this conversation. Up the top is an Australian developer. And what does he say? He says Australia should be 100 million people. It's fantastic. Let's go. We're going to be a great country. He says that because he's in the business of building apartments. It's good for his business. Down at the bottom of, is, of course, the famous population biologist, your guy, Paul Ehrlich, who recently came out and visited Australia. And he said, don't talk to me about 42 million people. You people are going to have to evacuate. So his prognosis was profoundly pessimistic based on his assessment of the carrying capacity of a particular landscape. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the businessman is just gung-ho, let's build, there's no problem. These two, these two views seem to be, to be a little bit extreme. And I'm working in the middle with some research I found from 2002 where our premier scientific organisation concluded that our country could support 50 million people. It could feed, have enough water and enough um, um, energy and so on for 50 million people. But if you read the quote, it's, it says, if those people live a moderate lifestyle. And therein lies a bit of a problem because I don't know about you, but I'm not moderate. And I'm not, I don't think politicians are going to stand up and start casting sustainable lifestyles in punitive terms. I mean, it's, sustainability is never going to work if it's, if it's punitive. It's going to only work if it's desirable and creative and, 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 and so on. So, again, there's, um, there, there is an issue there, um, how we... How we you know, be, there will be some behavioural changes, but I think it behooves us to make issues of sustainability, not pious and, and, and you know, and, and, and sanctimonious, but exciting and creative. This is the way most Australians view the world. They view it myopically and they're obsessed with their own property and its value, which is fair enough. It's my family, my house, my investment. I'll show you the true image of that house in a relational sense. That is the ecological footprint. There it is there. This is a family of four Australians living in that house, your average family living a moderate lifestyle. They require 50, 58 hectares of land for their food, energy and so on. This is 
unbeknownst to our average suburban dwellers, they are part of a global aristocracy. You just don't, when you walk out the front of the house, you just don't see the estate the way the English aristocracy did. It's globally distributed. If I build a suburb for 20 million Australians, there it is. It's only that big. That's all these things I'm showing you are scaled correctly. That's not that. You can see the other cities around the coast, Perth, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Hobart and so on. So it's not, it's not a question so much of scale in terms of sheer building, but there's the ecological footprint. So that does become a bit of a worry because that red square currently covers what is virtually entirely desert. These only 10% of Australia is arable. So I'm, I'm starting to move here towards a, trying to ascertain a carrying capacity or the limitations as to build up a methodology by which you make, might make the decision as to where this future growth should take place. 10% is arable, um, that's a very small Australia. So we're going to have to buy New Zealand probably in the future. This is the kind of thinking that goes on in Australia. It's very similar to the United States. And some of these things are quite compelling. I mean, I, we will have to build new pipelines from one side of the continent to the other. Australia survives at the moment because of these points. See the red dots? They're desalination plants. Every city has now hooked itself up to a desal plant. That's how we're, going to, that's how we're surviving. All the dashed lines represent big ideas. It's a history of big ideas to move water from where it is down, down to where we don't have it in the cities. And all those dashed lines, these are crazy schemes of building 3,000 kilometre, 2,000 mile canals across this dry continent to get, food, to get water to our cities. So what, I've started, what I'm starting to look at is, is getting water, I'm, I'm looking at the, the prospect of urbanisation where there is water with regard to climate change forecasting. This is a love. This is my personal favourite. I come from Western Australia, which survives by mining. We've got, you know, it's a big. It's a sort of an. It's not an ideas place, but big aggressive ideas have some currency there. This was this red star represents an idea from one of our mining magnates. He was just saying, look, problems with water and food in Australia. No, we what we've got to do is detonate the country. Just detonate that whole where that red star is, so that the the ocean can push further into the middle of the continent and we'll have evaporation, rain and bloody golf courses and suburbs and farms forever. You know, this is, this is, this is 19th century uh, thinking and it's, it's, you can't engineer your way out of these problems so easily. It's a very subtle landscape with very baffling uh, ecosystems and it needs to be approached sophisticated, in a sophisticated manner. Okay, there's the remnant vegetation. Australia is signatory to an international uh, treaty of biodiversity which states that we must retain and preserve and look after 10% of our biodiversity. It doesn't mean 10% of green stuff anywhere. It means 10% as a representative sample of the 400 or whatever it is regions. I'll show you here how many have we got. We've got 85 distinct bioregions and 405 subregions. So we need 10% of those regions to be salvaged. As climate change kicks in on that landscape, the gene pool can't move because the, all, all of the habitat is isolated. Everything's fragmented. Now, the scientists are telling us that, and there is dispute about this, but the scientists are telling us that what you really need to do is try and stitch together the fragments insofar as possible so the gene pool can move over time and adjust to climate change. So what we've done here is, we've, this is a work I'm doing with a PhD student of mine, Simon Kilbane, we're working on the proposition that we can cast a grid. That grid represents habitat corridors. It's a 25 metre, uh, 25 uh, kilometre, about a 15 mile graticule. Each of the green bandwidths is, is 600 metres wide. That's uh, quite a few feet. Um, and, um, um, and then rationalising that. By rationalising, I mean getting it on the ground. What that represents there is like a political game board. That's an even distribution of green, infrastru distribution of green infrastructure. And then we start testing it through, I'll show you, sorry, we're testing it through this transect here, which is about, um, you know, about 800 miles long. Studying the landscapes in that and testing to see how we adjust the grid, the idealised distribution on the ground to deal with all of the contingencies. So here we start on the coast, that's Perth, which we'll come back to later. We head out and so on and so forth. And you can see the fragments in agricultural landscapes, very similar here out into the desert, and then we, here you see it, we're just starting to, to, to get down to a finer scale and adjust the system so that we forge all the connections. Now I think that's an interesting project, it's, it's a big project, but it's not completely implausible with regard to a post-carbon economy, 
and, and it's a form of green infrastructure on a fairly compelling scale, and I am interested in that at the moment. I'll come down to the, city, the scale of Perth. This, this gets back to zooming, of course, you see. I'm, tr I'm trying to zoom you in and out, and now I'm going to zoom you right down from a national system, a proposition for a national green infrastructure, down to a single house, a single allotment in a suburb. Just quickly we'll do this. So we'll go into the city of Perth. There's the green infrastructure system at a slightly finer grain. Now we're pushing through suburbs and through a metropolitan context. But where those green lines hit the black dashed line on the boundary, they get stitched into the national system. So everything is continuous. Now I'll come down to that red, that red blotch that you see in the middle there, which is a, a real project I've been on for years, the suburban master plan for 40,000 people. There's the design. These, the straight lines represent a matrix of public open space. They're avenues of trees, they clean water, move cool air, bit of habitat and so on. Those straight lines, which are from the designers, they intersect with all of this wobbly organic stuff which is picking up drainage lines and wetlands and riparian zones through the site. The developers can do what they like in the grey. So the new urbanists can have a field day in there if they want, but they don't actually, they don't like, because they don't like working in between these avenues that we've put down. They can't do all their pattern making. And they argue that this, this attempt to stitch in a, a system of, of suburban infrastructure with a habitat system, they argue that, 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 up, that, 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 that those two things are completely incompatible. And I find that profoundly pessimistic. I think we've got to strive to hybridise these systems. It's good for communities to live adjacent to natural systems and, and, or denatured systems, whatever, but for the thing to start to work in a hybridised manner. Now, um, I'll zoom you in a little bit further. And incidentally, the development of the grey pays for the green. It's a developer contrib contribution scheme. That's lifting off all the green. That's what the, that's left, the, you know, for, for sheer, the yellow is where you can develop. You can see the way the housing lots start to line up orthogonally, the black up in, up in there. Incidentally, these straight lines, there's a rule that you can move them. You can start to drift them a bit if you need to for topography or whatever, but not too far. There's a limit. It starts to become, the project's becoming a nice weave. Um, so we'll zoom into there. This is a very crude diagram. It's just a cartoon, but uh, you'll get the point. You see, uh, there's, there's my, main, my main habitat corridor which links off the site to the national system. I come up here on a, this is one of the drainage lines in the site, and we're scaling. Here's one of the avenues of trees. Here's a street in a suburb. There's a house in a suburb. I can design the way that lot deals with water can design the way the street deals with water, the way that deals with water, and so on and so forth. So I've gone from one house to a nation via green infrastructure. That's a diagram worth fleshing out with a few years' research. OK, now, here's the growth of all of the cities in Australia at the moment. The size of the dot represents the rate of growth. It's radical. It's vast. And it's, it's, it's causing all sorts of consternation politically and socially. Communities are arcing up about what to do. Infrastructure is crumbling. Australia is very good at sprawling. We love suburbs. That's how we've traditionally lived. So the, the knee-jerk reaction is to continue sprawling. Sprawl is a difficult model to argue for. I reckon I could give you a pretty compelling argument for sprawl and a slightly more compelling argument against sprawl. Depends how you do sprawl. Sprawl's already pejorative, but I mean, you can do innovative sprawl. I think we have to. But the, the, the target in Australia has been generally to resist sprawl and achieve 60% infill development. So all of, of those 20 million people coming into Australia, we're trying to get 60% of them to live in apartments within the existing urban footprints. We've never been able to achieve that. The most we can achieve is 30%. We're really bad at doing density. And I presume that in much of North America, you're bad at doing density too. Or it's not an area that we're just generally not good at it. Um, when I do the calculations, what I've got, all this text here, we don't have to worry about, but these are all the predictions for growth. When I do all the numbers on that and, and, and look at the mid-century increase of population, I've, we're missing six million people. There are six million people unaccounted for, so I'm looking at where you might build a city for six million people, or, or cities. That's a really interesting project. You know, these are areas that we're trying to study. Not in, not in I mean, I'm trying to develop the method and the rationale by which you might locate new urbanisation, how you might seed that urbanisation, how you might, in a, in a landscape urbanist sense, do something catalytic to begin a new kind of city that, to what degree should it self-organise? Or should we just roll out vast grids and expect them to fill up like Manhattan? I mean, how do you start a city in the 21st century? So these are the sites we're looking at um, and studying in some detail. And I can illustrate this by coming down to... 
uh, this site that I know well. The X marks Perth, where I live, we'll look at that. The region is inside the one, which is just an exemplar of this larger national study, the Swan Coastal Plain. Oh, that's Dubai, Dubai, um, 1990. Look at it. I mean, that's instant urbanism for you. I, I, you know, it doesn't matter whether you think Dubai's a good thing or a bad thing. It just opens up the, the, the 21st century problem of urbanisation. It can happen very quickly in very unlikely places, not necessarily dependent on local landscapes. I happen to think that you've got a combination of... You've got a tension between regionalism, the landscape upon which your city actually depends, but as well you've got to understand the global flows into which the city is linked. This, this is the new dynamic, as it were. Here, here is what we've done, just as this is running scenarios. Scenarios are a good methodology because you don't appear heroic and, and final in your answer. You can involve the public and the political class in, in, in discourse if you use scenarios. Uh, it's inclusive, so we do, silly, we do you know, extremes, of course. We, oops, sorry. Uh, here what we've done is we've just said, oh, well, we'll just build suburbs right across that landscape and I can fit 90 million people in there. Here we pull back, second scenario, save all the vegetation because it is part of a biological hotspot, and we get 50 million people. The final scenario, which is one worth taking seriously, we combine agricultural production, availability of energy and water and so on, resource base, uh, and then get a population density out of that. So we're trying to get a kind of carrying capacity, and it shakes down to about 10 million people in this scenario, and it starts to look a bit like this. This is the potential wind energy, there's solar, there's some nuclear, there's distributed population growth through polycentric urban forms, and it can feed itself, more or less, more or less. So you start... These drawings become quite powerful in terms of D debate, you know, in a, in a particular community vis-a-vis -vis growth. And you can start to make it a bit sexier, but I've been very careful lately not to get into gorgeous images. I'm really pulling back and trying to keep them... It's hard. Representation at this scale is quite hard. I'm, I'm keenly aware of the hubris of doing panoramic imagery like this, but it's effective, as I say, when you're dealing with, with politicians and so on. You know, these could be pods of... Pods of um, you know, pods of 50,000 people and high you know, transport systems, agricultural landscape, productive land, retained habitats. There's nothing new in this. Much of Europe looks like that. Um, we'll move on quickly. Just I'll, I'll wrap up now with a, with a very brief focus on my city, which is a, I'm working at a metropolitan scale. The red is the current footprint, 100,000 hectares. I think, apart from probably Phoenix, I think this is the most sprawled city on Earth, Perth, for the, for the population. It's incredibly low density. The blue is the stuff that we're building suburbs in at the moment on the edge of the city. The black is the land we can push into. We've got 300,000 hectares of the stuff. We could sprawl forever. That is dangerous. The city can sprawl with massive population growth ad infinitum because the landscape doesn't present any obvious limitations in terms of there's no mountains or it's a sandy coastal plain. You just keep going. So I, I've been keen to resist that and I've asked the question, well, how would we now proceed to develop some scenarios that do locate an extra 2.5 million people in that metropolitan context? And, and, and you know, the, the, I'll give you, I, I can't show you all these scenarios. There's no point in doing that. It's, it's, it, but I'll show you a couple of examples by, to wrap up. That's what it looks like. That's how we develop at the moment. This is very wasteful. And the, the current policy is that 47% of the development should be infill and 53% greenfield. So of the 2.7 million people coming into that city, we're saying half will be sprawl and half will be infill. We won't achieve the infill, it'll be much more sprawl. So I'm, what I've done is create scenarios that... I'm going both ways. I'm not for sprawl or against sprawl. I'm saying let's do sprawl and do it well, let's do infill and do it well, and I'm trying to breathe some imagination into planning because planning is an idea is sort of free you know, zone, but planners are very powerful and, and, and I think it's worth um, developing relationships with them. Um, so, um, so what do you do? You set back all the green, I suppose. In a McCargian sense, this is still valuable as a, as a base layer. You know, you don't throw McCarge out because it's unfashionable. There is still some sense. There are still areas you don't want to go. You can preclude some areas from development. No one's done a green structure plan for this city. We did it really quite quickly, and it's good for the industry. Developers now know they can go into the white areas. Okay, it might not make a great city, but that there's no ecological argument as to why you shouldn't go into those white areas from a from a local landscape perspective. So, with that diagram, we then start to proceed to try and think of some imaginative ways that you might grow into those areas. Now, you know, 
again, you look to precedent. Frank Lloyd Wright, I mean, Broadacre City will, in my mind at least, it lives on. If you, if you take the petrochemicals out of it and, take the, and, and shift it, you know, zoom it a bit so that it's not so big, I think it's, there's, there's, a di there's the essence of something interesting there. So I've combined here Coolhouse, Wright, plus density, which Wright was opposed to, minus the cars. And I guess the proposition is, can that, can that be the formula for a 21st century form of sprawl that is productive? So it's trying to mix up food, transport systems and strike a certain level of density. There's your transport system, 800 metre graticule, no one's further than a five minute walk from transport. Then you take the urban, or add the urban urbanism to that. All of what, all of the remaining landscape can be productive landscape. And we've done this mathematically so that there's a balance here. You know, the amount of food that can be produced in here does tend to shape up the density in these areas. This is not a nice drawing, but I'm not trying to make it nice. Um, and, you know, that's a slightly more, that's a scarier version of it. Um, um, but it, this is important. You do get a sim potentially a symbiosis between the infrastructure, the green systems, the food production systems, water, nutrient exchange, energy, between the architecture, the transport. The, f the whole thing gets stitched in as one complete package and driven by, I think, a landscape architectural uh, sensibility. If I don't do this, if we don't do this, the new urbanists are going to design all that, to all that landscape I've been, I've been showing you. They already do. They just completely dominate it because their, 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 their pitch is so succinct, so easy, so palatable. And, and, and I, I find it offensive, actually, that, that, that cities are being shaped by such a... Um, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to get... Fuck. I do. I find it offensive. I do. And Charles has done such a good job. I mean, really, internationally, we're, my students and all the people I speak with are looking to, looking to you guys, the way you're just dealing with that debate. Um, and it's, it's very nice to see it being finally handled properly. Uh, so the other, now infill development. How do you take, how do you take a, a hub, oops, sorry, how do you take a, a hub and, and spoke model of sprawl and convert it into a tight network? How do you turn a city into a polycentric network that tightens up with density at certain points? That is precisely the research question that we're trying to deal with at home at the moment. And it's one that, it's not just Todd's, it's more than that. It's not just designing Todd's, it's about a whole metropolitan scale about the logistics of forming a, a network. And that's, it's, it's really, this is unknown terrain for me at least. And, and we've identified 103 places in the city where you can do density. The problem is they often look like this. How do I convince consumers to live in there? This is the, this is the place that cars made for themselves while we weren't looking. You know, now I've got to get in there and maintain affordability but retrofit those landscapes and increase density and it's really a challenge and do that on a metropolitan scale. The reason this is important is because billions of dollars will move in the direction that the designers, the planners or the designers decide where, what, thing, what infrastructure should go where on a metropolitan scale. So I've got 103 sites. Where should the hospitals go, the new universities? What sort of density? You know, how do you make those decisions holistically? I think that's a landscape urban, urbanist um, prerogative. Um, you, you, this, is, this is typical gridded, good old gridded suburbs. Um, you get a bit of density. You get a bit of you get a bit of density that people doing, are doing themselves, where they battle axe blocks and double up. It's not necessarily the best outcome because, as I said, these old suburbs can be retrofitted and they, they can become urban forests over, over time, and they, they really can be nice places for a certain demographic. Where you can go is, you can get in there, you know, develop, we can amass sites in there and knock all this, a lot of this stock is crap anyway, and you can start to develop density along transport routes. Problem there is again that it's a fairly aggressive environment, like it's not that desirable. You'll still, people will still want to go to the edge of the city and buy a, a brand new home in a suburb, tricked up suburb. But uh, we've got architects, uh, this is one, another one of my researchers, looking at architectural models that can cope with that environment um, without destroying the suburb but amping up the density on the transport corridors. Then you can look at your own city. doesn't matter if it's Boston. You could say, now, where should we try and do that in Boston or in Perth or wherever? In Perth, the red lines happen to indicate two main roads. The roads aren't that important. What's important is those red lines wrap the river and the river is amenity. So I'm simply saying put density where you've got amen amenity 
and do it on such a scale that you can make it affordable and then you might be able to convince Australians or Americans to live in apartments a la European densities and stop sprawling the city because they're within walking distance of the river. river. Um, you know, it looks like that, it looks like that. And finally, all I, I haven't, I'm not going to talk about all the scenarios because it's, it's, it's too much, but you, you can all do this. You develop up 10 scenarios, 20. It's, it's, you don't have to be a genius to do this. These are, pl if, you, if you keep them plausible, but you can start to amass them for any given metropolis and you've got a suite of propositions that can engage the public and the politicians and the developers and if you like you can go into detail and start working on the architectural scale but it's good to stay at the broad, stay at the landscape scale. Um, with the only ones, just so you know what this drawing means, the only ones we've talked about just then was, for example, was, um, was that, that there's the two, that's the roads I just talked about which wrap the river and we've talked about these 103 hot uh, points here. We talk, this could be Frank Lloyd Wright out here, Broadacre City, a la 21st century. So, you know, um, that's the work I've been doing. That's where I'm at now. I will conclude with this lovely figure. Poor old Atlas. This is our, 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 our long-suffering landscape architect. It's, it's incorrect that Atlas... Had, Atlas was punished for transgression and, 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 and guilty, which is a landscape architectural problem in many ways. We, we bear the... We have to... You know, the, the guilt of modernity is upon our shoulders. In actual fact, Atlas was, was... His punishment was to hold up the heavens, not the earth. But nonetheless, in popular culture, it's, it's Atlas holding up the earth. I think we can move away from this sort of um, sanctimonious, um, self-inflicted pain and enjoy being in the world creatively and deal with the issues I've mapped out, shuffle scales so we can connect our work holistically. I, I, I'm going to leave you with a really bold statement, and I, I mean it seriously. Um, this is landscape architecture's century, and I hope I've given you a few clues as to why that might be the case. And if that is the case, then you guys have to rise to the occasion. All right, thank you. I'm happy to take questions if anyone so wishes. Questions, criticisms, insults, anything? I know it's a lot of information, so it's kind of hard to... Yes. You're welcome. Thanks for the lecture. It was it was really informative and very um, eye opening. The question I have for you is: Are these projects are they <coughs> based in academia, or do you have um, are these hitting the ground? Uh, the project in Perth, um, and to what degree is the work that you're doing? Um, how is it being received? By uh, it's being it's being received. Um, the answer to how it's being received is that what you would call your governor will will request personal briefings, and that didn't happen to me before I did this work. Every um, cultural organisation, every layer of that particular community wants to know what this is about. Because, because it's very, it's not, it's not often that um, um, there, that, that even a modicum of creativity enters into the realm of planning at that kind of scale. So it's been well received, but things being received and giving people briefings is different to, as you say, things hitting the ground. It's very hard for things to hit the ground, as you say, at this scale. It's more a matter of influence. The future of that metropolis, like most, I don't know how it works here, really, the planning system, is being decided by planners and bureaucrats and pressure from the developers, right? That's how it's actually being decided. Out of that, gets policy gets squeezed, which has got nothing to do with design, usually. It's usually ideological and it's based in planning traditions. So I am now... no And, and that the, 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 the planning policy has been... Let's do 50% infill, uh, um, sort of new urbanist Todd stuff and so on, and, and then 50% greenfield, uh, pretty much business as usual with a few, you know, a little bit of green stuff added on to it. 
that's, that's about where it's at. Now what I've noticed since doing that work, even though um, once, people inv uh, once people take on new work, it also gives them then the material by which they can dismiss it. They go, oh, yeah, we've seen it now. It's just, just a person from the university doing something or other. But in actual fact, what I am noticing is policy is shifting. The planning bureaucracies are now moving into scenario planning and opening up the debate, and it's, it's, it's infectious. So I can't say to you that people are now building high density along um, those... The, I can't say to you that people are now building high density wrapping around the river in that metropolis for half a million people at a Barcelona density. That's not going to happen. But there is influence. Um, I can't say to you that people are doing greenfield development that is productive based on the precedent of Broadacre City and so on and so forth. That's not going to happen exactly. But there is a sense that this kind of work can break through. Um, I don't know if that's really answered your question, but it, 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 I'm, I'm, it's been quite, I would say, positive. Yeah. But that's also because the representation has worked, the storytelling aspect has worked, uh, the scenarios work because it's inclusive rather than exclusive and the hero planner architect designers not saying this is my master plan, you should just all follow it. So that's, that's, that's strategically quite useful. Um, and drawings, three dimensional, you know, it's propositional but not, like the drawings aren't esoteric so the public understand it and they don't feel like they're being sold because there's no kids with balloons and, you know, all lots of stuff hidden behind trees and... <coughs> Um, other people get confused. They look at those images and they go, what? You want to build that? And, you know, so it gets hard to strike a balance. Yep. And is it being produced in the university? Yes, this is research. This is funded work with a team of people. Like you couldn't... It would be hard for... Well, and some officers might be able to generate a bit of profit and they can then invest in this. It takes some time to do it. But I'm, I'm, I'm insistent upon that, actually. I think we need to try and invent our own work. You know, get ahead of the game. If you don't like the way Boston is being planned, then do your own plan. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, uh, actually, uh, it's very useful for the multi-scale analysis. Mm -hmm. It's uh, for us. We should across the scales and to to think broadly and to do the specific uh, work. But uh, for for China, for America, uh, and also for Australia, it's still huge territory. Yeah. And uh, how to consider this multi uh, multi scale analysis and uh, tools to be more uh, uh, practical? I mean, it's on not only spatially, or also politically, also organizing organizationally, or also, I mean, how to. Uh, uh, to be considered this system to be more useful or... Uh, are you, are yeah. you talking with, with regard to China specifically or, or anywhere? Yes, for example, in China, it's a quite a long history of this kind of a gap between higher level and yeah. lower level. Yes, but someone is making those decisions. Yeah, but it's not only a spatial skill. It's not... A, sure. Yeah, it's a system, it's administrative. Yes. So how to deal with uh, your study based on the holistic um, multi-scale analysis? I'm not quite sure of the question. I, I guess what I'm suggesting here is that if you don't develop methodologies to make those decisions in a rational manner and a creative manner, then those decisions are being made anyway. Where we're choosing, where urbanisation is occurring in China is being made by qualified, people qualified or otherwise according to certain um, rationales. <coughs> okay? So, in a sense, it's, it, it is happening. So I don't see why we shouldn't muscle into that territory and develop techniques by which we can say, well, here are some other ways forward. It's not as if we're putting up something that is antithetical to development. It just might inform the process a little bit. I don't see why you're suggesting it's impractical. Yeah, but you design the national green infrastructure. Oh, yes. And yes. also you design the media level and the local level. So yes. how to put this 
up level to down to bottom level. Oh, it's uh, quite hard for <laughs> to China to implement this. I would have thought China is not hard. It's, it's much harder in places. Uh, well, how about in uh, uh, Australia? Is to can't do that. Oh, in Australia, nothing will happen because we'll have to have five thousand workshops with every member of the community and take everyone's views seriously, and we'll just go round and round and round because democracy has become so unworkable. Nothing will happen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm being a bit cynical, but... I can't help commenting on that last comment. I mean, welcome to the Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it was very provocative, your suggestion or, you know, intimation of a coming new naturalism. If anything comes to mind specifically about what you see hovering on the horizon uh, with respects um, to that comment... Okay. I'd love to hear something. Um, I guess I guess I was. I, I mentioned a little bit that that in a, in a sort of modernist sense, with honesty, with regard to representation, that the thing that you're seeing, let's take a landscape, should not be in disguise. It should reveal its origins and the systems and the technologies and and the sort of the cultural matter behind it. So it should be like readable as a text. Um, I guess what I mean is that that, that aesthetic um, valuation might be put to the side because it might be... Well, I don't know, take a wetland, for example. You know, when, 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 they, when the landscape architects get hop into wetlands, they almost invariably do water-sensitive urban design and you get lots of furry stuff on it and it, it, it looks like nature. And I guess... My reaction to that has always been that that is the subjectivity of the designer pursuing a kind of prelapsarian aesthetic rather than an absolutely rigorous ecological um, um, way of treating that system. I mean, for all I know, if we look at it, we could do something with bright blue plastic which might function much better for that particular ecology, depending how we studied it. I think, I think what, I'm, what I'm coming to realise is that... Um, um, the way n the way natural systems tend to configure themselves once they're once they're activated, even if they're coming from a from an or original point of injury, they do tend to naturalise. And I'm no I'm no longer so worried about that. I think that there could be. Um, I guess I'm I, I, I'm I'm not sounding very clear on this because it's it's um, but I but I, I think that when I say a new naturalism, it will have its origins in technology and science, but it will look like the nature we've lost, and I think that's probably okay. Whereas my reaction typically would have been that that's dishonest. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be trying to pretend that we can recreate these systems. In actual fact, to recreate a wetland and an associated landscape so that it looks natural is incredibly sophisticated work. If you get, you know, you really get into it, get the diversity back in there and make it run by itself over time and it, it, so it can evolve and be robust is an incredibly technological and scientific enterprise. It's not just the painterly um, connoisseurship of the designer that's doing that. So I guess that's what I mean by a new naturalism. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you said that sustainability is never going to be never going to work if it's punitive, and uh, uh, right. I completely agree. I'd also say that we're never actually going to get to reach sustainability through kind of top-down planning or political uh, procedures, but right. rather through kind of a gradual change in culture and how we uh, see ourselves within the uh, within the earth. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that, specifically in regards to representation. Uh, the first thought that I have, uh, I think, is, is I think the point is well made, and I think if, if you're being very polite, I, I'm going to. I think I can tease out a kind of. There's a latent crit critique there, which is that the work I've shown you is a bit top down. It's a bit heavy handed. I completely agree. I would love to do a lecture for you in a year or two and show you another end of it, which is more more where talk do a talk about how we could do small scale activations, which might then lead to bigger things. So I take your. I think your point is well made. Um, um, what was the what was the question at the end? Because I, 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 I just latched onto the, what I thought was the critique. Uh, well, just 
what we could as designers do to be catalysts for that kind of gradual transformation, specifically yeah. in regards to what we do in representation? Yeah, well, well yeah, rep representation, um, as opposed to, well, representation is just absolutely intrinsic to it in terms of, because uh, in how you represent ideas. Um, what designers do is they have to be cunning. Designers have to be cunning and find sites and find propositions which have efficacy in a given cultural circumstance. This work that I've shown you, if you took it, if we take it seriously as, oh, he wants to build that, it's kind of absurd because it's heavy handed. What is catalytic is that someone produces scenarios in a given community at a given point in time which radically shifts the, dis the debate. You know, that, so that's, that's catalytic in terms of large scale metropolitan planning because where I am at the moment, that city is dealing with large scale metropolitan issues as a matter of urgency. That might not be the case in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, we might be better off going to vacant lots and doing really fine little things in vacant lots, which act as, you know, we, so it's site-specific, culture-specific, politics-specific. Um, and, and all we can do, of course, is, 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 I guess what I'm encouraging, and this is not, there's nothing new here, is that the, the, lands, the landscape architect is a person, an emerging character that is capable of looking holistically at systems without hubris, without arrogance. But, that, but, 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 but that our, our capacity to look across a range of systems, both natural and cultural, gives us a unique position and relationship to the city, irrespective of scale. And then if you combine that with creative intelligence and, and inventiveness, both programmatic and formal and representational, then, then you know, we are vital players in, in the way in which modernity is unfolding. To date, we have been modernity's decorators, we've been modernity's cleaners, we have been modernity's apologists. Actually, me, being cleaners is not so bad. Cleaning is a lot to clean up, but, you know, being, being now engaged with the city which is the central, surely the central, history will remember the central shift from, land, from previous situation through landscape urbanism was re-engagement with the city. I don't know if I've answered your question, but anyway. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a question uh, in terms of, of the drawings you showed us. Basically, um, you're showing us green in a very generalized way and then city. So uh, my question is, given that um, as population grows, agriculture, for instance, which is one of the systems that you mentioned but did not differentiate in your, in your representation, will change its own logistics, its ways of production, its own infrastructure, yep. Yep. as will energy, because there will be more to make and more to deliver and more to produce. Mm. So how do those other things that appear in your system play out in your scenario building? And you also talk about have you know, doing this work collaboratively and that you talk to scientists. So what, what other disciplines specifically and what how might they inform what you do beyond, you know, the node and spread out of of um, network that you just showed us? Uh, the the yeah, landscape yeah, remains yeah, undistinguished yeah. yet. That's that's a that's a great question because it, it it does go to the heart of how you might progress this 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 work. Um, I, and I I can't I, I'm not going to pretend to to say that all of the knowledge that you've just mentioned is embedded in this work. These are cartoons, okay? Um, I am now, and the question has always been with this sort of work, well, how far should you take it? Where, where do you go now? Do you go down into detail? Do you go out into the systems? Do you form collaborative teams across the university and with industry? It depends on the research environment. Luckily, and I was saying to Charles before, in Australia, it, it, what surprised me, this trip to the States, that the research where you, how you construct research propositions is very seems is quite vague to me. I don't know how it works. Luckily, we have infrastructure for research where you can compile teams. So, for example, the, the, one of the aspects of that I talked about the 103 sites to try and form a network of infrastructure and density. 
I have now assembled a team that involves, it involves developers, it involves public agencies, it involves ecologists, economists. So I've, I'm pulling those people together so that we can then go beyond the cartoon and start, you know, because it'll take years. If any, any of those scenarios, to be for them to mature beyond caricature, would take years. So I can only answer your question by saying that I'm in the process of assembling teams to do these things, also with water particularly. Um, and, and the scientists that I'm working with are, are people, for example, engineers that are very, very involved in the purification and the recycling of water but have no idea about urbanism. I mean, just they just, you know. Or, and the ecologists and the guys that are working on the heat island mitigation um, and the hydrologists um, to try and... And, and we, I have those teams. But I have them in place. And as I said, just, the, just, to, just for us to begin to develop a common language is, is proving difficult. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'm embarking on research projects now to try and turn those things into more mature and, and more resolved work. That would be the, that'd be the natural evolution of this kind of study. Yep. All right. Oh, one more. Um, as you present your work to urban planners yes. and developers, and I think about the developers that I'm used to meeting here in Boston, what is their response and how do you deal with things like, you joking, you're going to take this and make this car free or you're going to change the density in this way? What is the response that you get and how do you deal with it? The, uh Car free, car free is is is, is um, car free is only serious if you if you can pull back from the current the current planning system allows the city to accrete. If I if you pull back and say wait a minute, you've got four decades and you've got up to two million people. That's a whole new city. Then it becomes possible to entertain the possible to, to entertain the prospect of lying laying out. A public transport, a public transport infrastructure. Um, when you think in that time frame, if I now go to a developer and say we're going to do a, do a project without cars, it would be a very brief meeting. I understand that. I mean, I think cars are good. I look for. I'm not anti-cars. That was just again. Some of these things are provo provocations to see if to test ideas. I think um, um, you know we can look forward to, to cars that are much more efficient and so on and so forth. And there, you would you would augment us, but but. Uh, 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 you know, the sort of platonic ideal of an 800 metre grid of, of, of transit is viable, the, supplemented by an, a finer grain of systems in, in, within, the, within the grid units. But that's not to say that logistics and trucking and so on would just, that would all continue as normal, of course. Developers get excited, believe it or not. De developers don't look at this stuff and go, you're, you know, you're just, who are you? What are you doing? They don't do that. No, developers like it. Developers see opportunities. I mean, I've always said the, the developers are smart. They're not just cowboys. I mean, they, they used to be, but they're smart, a lot of them. They read a city as an opportunity. Um, of course, they're obsessed with... with, with they, they read the city as, as, as a financial scape, but they, they, so they have, they have to. So I'm, I, I usually don't have a problem with the developers. And the de because what the developers want is certainty. They want the bureaucrats to stop meddling in everything and for there to be clear and compelling visions on a certain scale that they can then hop into and do the work. So if, if, we, if we could get the planners in my city to release and to rezone those roads that I showed you that wrap around the river and just change the density, just change the coding, the developers will get in there and do the rest. They agree with that. Um, I don't think I can, I, can, I can persuade Woolworths to go and build a food city like I showed you as a new model of greenfield development, but I don't know yet. I, one of the interesting things was I thought one of the most I thought that when I would be when I would be laughed out of the room speaking to politicians, and I frequently do now, was food. I thought they'd just think that was this is just like this is this is crazy, and they didn't. They took it very seriously. They they were keenly aware of an impending food crisis. Um, 
and of course you get reactions which are uh, simply defensive. There's a massive planning bureaucracy in, my, in, in, in our cities and the planners are entrenched and they don't like people coming in from left field doing a whole bunch of visuals which is based on, at least to a degree, some ideas. So there's, a, there's, a, there's certainly a cohort that feel threatened and wish to just shut it down. Uh, yes, one more. <laughs> Charles. Charles is going to wrap up, I think. Um, Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Charles, do you want to wrap up or not? No, no. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you.